would stand uh, for the uh, reading of God's Word. We have uh, a few scriptures to uh, build a foundation on. And uh, the first is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. As many of you know, we lost our transmission with uh, face, uh, Facebook, and so it's uh, YouTube right now, and I hope uh, you're able to, uh, uh, to pick us up there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verse 14. I'm reading out of the King James Version. I'll give you the title of the presentation, God's Spiritual Quarry. God's Spiritual Quarry. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. King James says here, But the natural man, or the solical man, or the carnal person, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he or she that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. I bring your attention uh, to verse 14. But the natural man, the carnal man, the solical man, the man who's led by the solical, uh, the soul uh, area within our lives rather than the Spirit of God, it, it's uh, foolish, the things of the Spirit are foolishness to him. They, are, uh, they don't receive them nor accept them. Why? They're spiritually discerned. Now I want to make sure those of you that are spiritual, that as this message unfolds, that you are willing to receive the things of the Spirit today. Again, the Bible declares that the solical man won't receive the natural man, receive the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. So again, as this presentation unfolds, there are going to be some things that are going to begin to challenge uh, certain dynamics of the natural man and the solical man, and I want you and I to be in a position in your heart to receive the things of the Spirit and, and to embrace them, okay, to embrace them. Second reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, right across the, the page there, verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul, he said here, Do you not know that the, you are the temple of the living God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Dwells in you. Again, underlying the fact that you now are the spiritual temple of God. No longer is there a natural temple uh, in terms of uh, Solomon's temple, Herod's temple, Zerubbabel's temple. You are personally, you are God's temple and the Holy Spirit dwells within your life. Turn right now to Romans chapter 5. Excuse me, how about left? Turn left to Romans chapter 5, verses 3. Romans 5, we'll start with verse 1. Romans 5, 1 through 5. Romans chapter 5, 1 through 5. Paul again said, Therefore, being justified by faith, you and I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ for whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein you and I stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Verse 3, key verse, And not only so, but you and I glory in our tribulations, also knowing that tribulations worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, Verse 5, and hope need not be ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which he has given unto us. Now if you're able before we pray, if you would um, put a mark uh, to the right of, in First Peter 
chapter 2, 1 through 8. Uh, we will bring that up today, 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 through 8. And then again, since I haven't had you in a while, if you would put a marker in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7. So if you'd put a marker in 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 through 8, and then all the way back to the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7, uh, those will be uh, key scriptures uh, for you and uh, for me. God's spiritual quarry. Let's pray. God, again, thank you so much for your holy word. We stand upon uh, the shoulders of martyrs who have uh, died and given their life for this holy Bible. And I would pray that you would, uh, and uh, your beloved, O oh God, would uh, embrace and acknowledge the deep sacrifices that have been made over the centuries whereby we here today can sit and stand and listen to the oracles of your precious voice. I pray, O oh God, that none of the words through a clay vessel, a broken man, would return void, but they would be sent out uh, like your heavenly butler, and they would perform the work that you would have within each and every single letter in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you again for the rich opportunity to declare your holy word. May it perform again its necessary works in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God's spiritual quarry. God's spiritual quarry. I'm not sure if any of you have ever actually seen a quarry before. Up in the northwest, uh, there are two that uh, are massive, and even the trucks and the wheels uh, of these uh, machinery that go in and excavate uh, tremendous uh, rock from the, uh, from the walls of, of uh, the sides of mountains, and uh, they would excavate this quarry and bring out these, uh, these stones that are massive. And uh, the theme of this presentation again is God's spiritual quarry and uh, I want to see if these possibly are some of the silent questions that maybe some of you are asking today that maybe you're silently asking what is God doing in my life at this time right now maybe you're asking what is he doing we're in lockdown we're in COVID and and we don't get to meet uh, physically and, and a host of things uh, that you might be asking, what is God doing in my life right now? I can't see or acknowledge His activity, His divine hand working in my life. Maybe some others, you feel like, I'm just here. And I'm just going through motions of living life. And, uh, and I just don't even see the validity, authenticity of God working right now in my life. Someone else might be saying to themselves, why am I having to go through such challenging times? How come so much suffering and tribulations and sorrow? And so my hope today is to answer these questions for your life and mine. And I'm going to declare to you what your Bible declares that He is doing right now in your life. If again you were silently or even uh, verbally asking those questions, Lord, what are you doing in my life? I don't see any any activity. I'm going through motions, and I just kind of I'm just kind of here. And uh, I'm going to declare to you what your Bible says, what He's doing right now in your life, so that you know, and you don't have to hear any whispers of the devil or his minions telling you certain things, or even this world's chatter and talking heads. I'm going to tell you what. But your Bible declares that God is doing right now in your life. Number two, I'm going to tell you why, according to your Bible, why you may not see any activity of God in your life right now. Again, it's not going to come from my words. It's going to be what God says. It's going to be His Word. And I'm going to tell you what His Word declares to you why you may not see any activity in your life right now from God. You may not even feel like He's moving within your life, your family, or you can't point to say it's here or it's there. 
I'm also lastly going to declare to you what God's spiritual quarry really is. I'm going to tell you God does have a spiritual quarry. I'm going to explain to you what that quarry is and the excavations of stones, yea, living stones, that he's refining, preparing, and hewing out of the beautiful rock of your salvation and mine, Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to declare right now, what is God doing in my life? Again, I look around and I don't see much of anything happening at all. I see here that the nations are locked down in their suffering, tribulations, and sorrow happening to my left and to my right. And I don't again know what God is doing in my life. I'm just seemingly here. I'm just, I'm just doing the best I can. What is God doing in my life? You were asked to pull up 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 through 8. This is going to declare what God right now is doing in your life. I'll give you a moment to pull it up so you and I can actually read what God declares that he is doing right now in your life. What is God doing in my life right now? Peter declares, 1 Peter 2, 1 through 8, uh, Peter says, as you have come to him, Jesus Christ, the living stone, rejected by people, but chosen by God. I love that. Chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built, listen now, into a spiritual temple, being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For your Bible declares, see, I have laid a stone in Zion, a chosen and a precious capstone. And the one who trusts in him shall never be put to shame. Beloved, what is God doing right now in the midst of your life? Listen to me. He is building a spiritual house, a spiritual temple. It's not a natural temple. It's not Herod's temple. It's not Solomon's temple. It's not Zerubbabel's temple. Now, it may not seem so exciting yet. Wait till the end of the presentation. But I want you to have a firm foundation this. Regardless of what isn't happening in your life, God is doing this right now. He is building you. He is building the spiritual temple, the spiritual house. House, which is you Christian you may not know and you'll find out you'll may you may not know how he's doing it you may not know all of the particulars in terms of the master builder but again I want you to underline first Peter 2 1 through 8 what is God doing listen again I want you to say it while you're sleeping that he is building me he is building the spiritual temple your Christian Christian life. That's what he's doing right now. You, again, may not see any activity. It doesn't mean that he's not building something. I have read that to you, 1 Corinthians 2, 14. The natural man, solical man, does not accept the things of the Spirit. Why? They're foolishness to him. He cannot discern them. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. You cannot look at God's uh, capacities of what he's doing right now with a natural, carnal, solical eye. You can't look to the left and to the right and be able to always point to God's handiwork within your life. You may be in a season right now where you can't see anything happening divinely. It doesn't mean that God is not doing something in your life. What's he doing in you? You should declare he is building my life. He is building a spiritual temple that is going to bring forth spiritual sacrifices unto him. I want you to know what your Bible says. What's he doing? He's building a spiritual house. He's building my Christian life. He's building my Christian life. Okay? And it goes on, and I, and I just, again, underline this, that nothing in God's uh, capacity of building is wasted. 
Did you hear me? During this time where at least for most of us, we can look and say, wow, what a waste, you know. <laughs> there, we just can't do this. We can't do that. What a, two, and I, I just hear it even from Christians. Oh, 2020, what a wasted year. Well, that's not what your Bible says. God says that he does not allow even a moment to go by for the saint of God that is wasted. He doesn't waste a season, an hour, a month, a week. He doesn't waste anything in terms of his construction and his capacity of building in your life. He doesn't waste anything. Now, I mentioned to you we used to build a lot of homes and we would have building crews for the new builds, and we would have other crews for remodeling. And uh, oftentimes, almost every time, especially on the new builds, uh, there would be a pile of uh, 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 construction uh, materials that were not used. Uh, areas and lumbers that weren't cut properly, they would throw them in a pile tiles that were, uh, didn't fit properly on the roof, sheet rock that uh, you know, wasn't cut well and wasn't mended well, a host of things. So you would have at the end of your construction, you would have a lot of wasted material. And again, you have a builder by the name of Jesus Christ. He hasn't and does not waste anything in your day, your hour, your week, and your year in respect to building the spiritual life called you Christian. There is no waste within him. And I want you to really understand this within the dimensions of living your life that God is active in your life. And I'm going to declare to you how he is being active even if you don't see it. Even if you don't see it. God is moving in your life. He's building a spiritual house and he doesn't waste anything within your tribulations, trials, nor tears. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 declares we walk by faith and not by sight. Did you hear that? We walk by faith and what? And not by sight. You don't need to look for it. You need an eye to realize that it's the walk of faith and that God is doing this spiritual work and most often it's an invisible work. God is an invisible God. He's an invisible God that fills heavens and earth. No man has seen God and lived. Why? He's an invisible spirit. Okay? Now, we know what he's doing and now, again... What exactly or why don't I see any activity of God's handiwork within my life? Why don't I see anything? How come I can't point to he's doing this and he's doing that in my life? Key verse, 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7. 1 Kings 6, 7, I want you to see it and uh, we'll read it together. And it's going to answer that question, your Bible is, why I don't see God's visible activity in my life, and I don't know what he's doing. One individual, a young woman, said to me when I was uh, uh, speaking to her and counseling her on the phone, she says, you know, God evidently doesn't listen to me or doesn't hear me. And I said, well, uh, the key issue is, are you willing to hear him? Are you willing to allow God's word to declare to you what it is he's doing and, uh, and how he's doing it, okay? So now why, why don't you see any visible activity of God? 1 Kings 6, 7, listen, beloved, if you don't have it open, listen. It's talking about King Solomon's temple, David. He had stored up all of the wealth and he used it to build Solomon's temple as David passed away. And here is uh, the key verse, 1 Kings 6, 7. Solomon's temple was constructed using finished stones. Please listen. Cut at the quarry. Cut at the quarry. So that there was no hammer, no chisel, no iron tool, 
no axe that was heard in the temple while it was being built. Did you, did you hear that? That as they were in the quarry and they were excavating large stones to build this temple that was so magnificent, the queen uh, of Ethiopia came for thousands of miles just to gaze at the beauty and the splendor of it, that this temple was built and carved and stones coming out of a quarry. And yet there was no sounds that were heard by the hammer, by the chisel, by the axe, by any iron tool in the construction and the hewing out of these stones for the building of God's house. Now you are the temple, the building, the spiritual house of God. And liken unto Solomon's temple, there is a quarry. It's God's spiritual quarry. And he does have chisels, hammers, tools, axes, everything at his disposal to hew out and to build, yea, stones, living stones, fitly joined together to build individually you and also his corporate church. That God is uh, moving, he is active in a spiritual realm that maybe you can't hear. They couldn't hear the hammer, the iron tool, the axe, nor the chisel. And yet God was bringing forth the stones that were going to make a magnificent temple that all of the world would gaze at and realize that only God himself could have constructed this. I declare to you what your Holy Bible says, that you may not hear the activity of the hammer, of the chisel, of the axe, of the iron tool. You may not be able to point to this and point to that. And you may not be able even to acknowledge that there is divine activity happening where on the inside of your life that only God himself is able to do. But just like the temple of old, God is working within the quarry his own spiritual quarry, and he has tools that are actually beginning to now shape, form, and fashion you and I, again, to be built in a spiritual house individually, and also you and I together. You and I together. Now, let me again remind you that there is a spiritual quarry just like there was a natural quarry. There's a spiritual quarry and there is a natural quarry. Again, you won't hear the sounds of the hammer. What's God doing in you, brother? I don't know. I can't hear anything. I can't see anything. I don't know if he's doing anything. Well, you know this, that your Bible declares that he's building a spiritual house, okay? And it's an invisible work. It's an invisible work. He said it's like the Holy Spirit. You can't say it's over here, it's over there. But you can actually begin to see the winds blowing within your life and mine. Even when there is seemingly nothing heard or seen, I want to declare to you that may be the most divine activity that you will find out here that God's doing in your life. What is quarry in the Hebrew actually is the word Massah. And watch this. Now we move into now we know what God is doing. And we do know, if I don't see any activity, that that is like the temple of old. He's still constructing. He's still building. He's still hewing out living stones being prepared for a spiritual temple. And so now what is this quarry? What's happening here, if that's where all of this uh, excavation was taking place, the actual Hebrew word is called Massah, M-A-S hyphen S-A, Massah. And it literally means, watch now, a location where stones are cut, refined, prepared, and polished. It is a location where stones are cut, 
refined, prepared, and polished. Again, your Bible declares that you and I are living stones being built into a spiritual house, Peter said, to bring forth spiritual sacrifices unto God, acceptable unto Him. And God has a spiritual quarry, just like up in Washington, the two quarries that I would visit and watch them with the machinery uh, that was so um, gigantic. Did you know, beloved, and we'll push into this here in a minute, that Solomon's temple, they actually, the uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian, as well as the Talmud and the Mishnah, which is an oral and a written uh, um, uh, traditions of what was happening during the lives of Israel, and even all the way through the building of Solomon's temple, watch, that they report that most of the stones were roughly cut out, not all, cut out 12 by 15, they were 12 by 15 feet, and they weighed over 2,500 tons. Did you hear that? A ton is 2,000 pounds, so you can do the math that they were massive stones being uh, excavated and hewn out of the quarries to build Solomon's temple. They were transported through a host of uh, uh, areas and ways. And even today, as we would go to Jerusalem, some of the original stones of that size, dimension, and weight are still there at the very bottoms of the foundation of that uh, temple that's there now. That the weight, the height, the width, the length of those stones were so massive and again, this is uh, the quarry, is the location where the stones were cut, refined, prepared, and polished. Watch now, it also means Massah. It means the place where weapons were prepared. It means the place of the pulling back of an arrow within a bow. So God is, is, is doing a work of, of hewing out living stones. And some can bear great weight. Some are able to actually bear great weight for the things of his kingdom. Beloved, that's one of the reasons why you're going through what you're going through. Why? So he's preparing you like a living stone, like a stone of the quarry of old, to be able to bear the weight of a host of areas that are going to be necessary in the life that you're living here and your family and the great calling God has on your life. He is building, refining, preparing. He's bringing forth weaponry within this quarry, Massah. Massah. Uh, this quarry, I'm going to tell you, God's spiritual, quarry, uh, God's spiritual quarry. Listen to me now, right here. What is God's spiritual quarry? Where's all of this happening? It's in this life right now. It's in the life that you're living. Everything, watch now, that's happening right now in your life is God's spiritual quarry. It's the place where He's preparing. He's refining. It's the place where He's polishing. It's the place where He's cutting living stones, you and I, so that you and I can be fit properly, joined together, building a spiritual house that only He Himself is going to receive glory. Okay, let me pause a minute, and you look around your life, and you go, I don't see anything he's doing. What is he doing? One, he's building you. He's building the spiritual life. He's building the spiritual temple. Two, how's he doing it, or how come I don't see any activity? Beloved, because it is an invisible work that he's doing inside of your life. A natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit that they're foolishness to him. Well, I don't see what he's doing. You're carnal, brother. You're carnal. Not everything is going to be working in a, car, a carnal way, a solical way, a natural way. God is an invisible God. You were born again. Can you explain how that happens in a natural way? It wasn't because necessarily you did anything. It was because of the grace of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What do you think that he that began the work, he's able to finish the work in your life? What's he doing? He's building you. 
He's building a spiritual house, 1 Peter 2, 1 through 8. Two, you don't see any activity. Well, you didn't see any activity in the quarry when he was doing the, uh, the temple of, of Solomon. And now you're the spiritual temple. You don't hear any, ha- look at my life. You, you may not, oh, well, he, what's he doing in, in my life? What's he, what's he doing in your life? I can't see, you know, where, where's the chisel? Where's the hammer? Where's the iron tool? I don't see anything. I don't hear anything go- going on. What's God doing? What's God doing in our nation? Beloved, listen to me. There's a lot that God's doing in this nation. I'll, I'll tell you hopefully in a moment here. There's a lot that God is doing in the quarry in this nation that maybe you and I don't see yet or we can't hear it yet. But your Bible declares that there is work going on in the quarry. Where's the quarry? It's right here. Watch now. Please listen. It's right here, right now in your life. This life is God's spiritual quarry. Everything that's happening, everything that's not happening is God's quarry and how He's preparing you, refining you, shaping you and His church. Shaping you and His church. Now, let me just give you some examples of some of the tools that he's using right now in the quarry of life. In the quarry of life to shape you and I, prepare you and I, to to weaponize you and I in this hour that we're living in. Number one, here we go, it's personal relationships. Okay, here we are in the spiritual quarry. Where's that? It's your life right now, brother. It's, it's what's happening in your life, and one of the tools, it's a sharp tool, it's probably a chisel. He mentioned the chisel. <laughs> Personal relationships are a, are a tool within this life, within God's spiritual quarry, that have the nucleus and the DNA to bring forth, prepare, and, and actually to begin to uh, 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 refine the living stones to him and the building together of his body. Listen now, everything that you're going through with your husband, with your wife, with your child, with your children. Please listen to this, I'm going to underline it. Everything that you're going through with a parent, an employee, an employer, a neighbor, Everything under the theme of personal relationships, that is a tool within God's quarry, your life. 97%, I believe, of Christians, even the bride, missed this in the life of the quarry. We most, not all, most of us don't even contemplate or even connect personal relationships with the development of living stones being hewn and being prepared for God to build a spiritual house. Most of us don't connect when we're having trouble with a a mate, when we're fighting with a a child or the child with the parent or, or an employer or an employee. We see it, most of us, we see it in a natural way. How could they do that? Why did they say that? Rather than, please listen, rather than first pausing a minute and realizing you're a spiritual person and you're willing to accept the things of the Spirit and refuse to call them foolishness. For the natural man, the carnal man, the solical man does not accept the things of the Spirit. They're foolishness to him. Watch. He cannot understand them. Why? They're spiritually discerned. So what, again, I'm, I'm endeavoring to do for me and you is that everything that's happening on a relational end, first and foremost, you and I need to realize that's part of the life of the quarry. 
that every problem, heartache, difficulty you and I are having on a personal relationship has within its nucleus a capacity for God to chisel away, to begin to refine, to begin to smooth out, and to bring forth a spiritual temple, a life that others can tangibly see that God has done a deep work inside of your life, that they can smell something different. They can actually now see something different. Why? Because God is then able to move you out of the quarry and begin to establish you and to build upon your life. No longer leave this meeting today, wherever it finds you, having a carnal, solical, natural uh, uh, thought in your life concerning personal problems. First and foremost, God, what are you trying to build in my life? What are you wanting to change in my life rather than trying to change him or change her? Turn that around and you, a spiritual person, willing to accept the things of the Spirit, allow, watch now, allow the deeper work of God to do its work in your life and in mine. That every tear, every misunderstanding, every problem, every fight, whatever it is, Lord, what is it that you're wanting to do in the quarry? In my life, we look at it henceforth in a spiritual uh, dimension and we begin to now yield to God, to his word and endeavor to walk, watch, in obedience to it, in obedience to it. So going forward, I'll ask you, what is God's spiritual quarry? It is this life. And even as the quarry of old, where God, you couldn't hear the work that was happening. You couldn't see what was taking place in the quarry. It's the same with your life, beloved. Same thing that was happening in the Old Testament. Now you, the New Testament temple. And everything that's happening on this, you are in life's quarry God's spiritual quarry, and he has a chisel, and he's using personal relationships to polish, prepare, smooth, cultivate his life within your life. What are the other uh, ways and tools that he's using in this quarry? I want to say and declare to you, according again to your Bible, he is going to decimate And he's going to rid you and I of pride. Did you hear that word, pride? It is the the essence of who Satan is. It is the reason why he and his minions were exiled from heaven. The Bible says that he was lifted up in pride. Pride is a deceptive work within the soul And the spirit of a man and a woman, it is cloaked in a host of of masquerading people. Most of us that get born again, we are like stubborn mules rather than little children. And it takes the actual quarry where God is able to bring an iron tool and or a hammer that will begin to decimate pride and to begin to bring forth true humility and a fragrance that's becoming unto God and represents Jesus Christ on the earth represents Jesus Christ on the earth. Many within Christendom, they want to be the big stone. They want to be that, put me, you know, build this and hewn me out and <laughs> put me right in the middle of, uh, of the temple. I, you know, I, I, I'm going to get big up in here. And so, you know, I'm the, I'm the prophetess and I'm the prophet and I'm the apostle and, and I have more churches than you and, and I'm such a much and this and that. We, we, we are deluded, many of us, many of us with pride. And we may not even realize how it's active in our own lives. Did did you know, beloved, when they were taking out these uh, stones to be built in uh, Solomon's temple? Watch now. Josephus. Wow. 
Was that fast or slow for you? <laughs> now watch this now. Again, pride. We may not even realize how active it is in our lives and how it manifests in our lives, but God does. And you may not even see it, hear it, or even know about it, but you are in His quarry. You are in the quarry of life. And He has tools for Steve and for every person, personality, every soul, every situation, he knows my frame and he knows yours. He may need this iron tool for me, and he may this need this little thing over here for you, but he knows how to prepare, refine, cut these stones. Now watch this. Josephus remarked, and I have his books uh, somewhere in these uh, 2,000 here uh, library, all of his books. Watch what he says now. Now, it's not Bible, but he does declare that these stones that were hewn out for Solomon's temple, and they were, watch now, they were, they were, they were brought together in such a uniformity that you could not see any joints between them. Did you hear me? You could not see any joints between them. They were so unified and sealed together. There was no, I'm the big stone, I'm the big man, I'm the big Christian, I'm the evangelist, I'm the one that has more on my mailing list, I'm the one that has more TV time, I get more offerings than you, I have more people in the church than you, I have this and that, the stench of pride that permeates in a host of different masks that masquerade in Christendom. And God, listen, beloved, is so committed to bringing forth a spiritual house and a spiritual temple, your life and mine, and the church corporate that he's willing to use and pull out of the toolbox anything necessary to decimate and to destroy pride at its very root and foundation. What a beautiful thing to see all of the stones and you can't even tell which one from another one. There, there is no individualism within the, the beauty of God's spiritual temple and house that he's building. You won't say any longer, she sings better than her. He sings and plays better than him. You won't say anymore, he's a better preacher than her. She's a better preacher than him. Why? Because the spiritual man and woman know that God is taking these living stones and he's bringing them together with such refinement. Watch now, it begins to breed such unity rather than individualisms within Christendom. It isn't going to be any longer the understanding of this one and this one. It's going to be us. It's going to be we. There is no separation and they couldn't find a joint between the two. Isn't that amazing? I underline the power, watch now, of unity. I underline the power of these living stones coming together. Watch now, relinquishing their individual capacities and giftings and yielding one to another for the beauty and the power of unity. It is like the uh, spices making forth uh, the actual uh, uh, prayers and incense that God uh, commanded the Israelites to make of those five major spices. He said the power comes when they are mixed together. Not individually, even though each individual spice had its own fragrance. God says that isn't what's going to be burned on the altar of incense. It's going to be when they're brought together and they are unified, then that brings a beautiful fragrance unto God. Pride is going to be decimated within his body. There's going to be such humility and there is going to be this uh, understanding that only Jesus Christ is going to be seen within your life and mine and you and I are going to revel in that knowing that he's doing a deep work in the quarry. I need a good shout and an amen out there in your life. The Bible declares in Psalms 133, we did a two, three hour teaching called the corporate anointing. I'll just read the scripture. And it said, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together 
in unity. It is like the precious anointing upon the head of Aaron that ran down to his beard, that went down to the actual hem and skirts of the garment. There the Lord commanded the blessing, yea, blessings evermore. Again, without pulling up the, uh, uh, which I believe was a wonderful uh, message on the corporate anointing, again, realizing that unity is in contrast with pride. Pride is individual. Pride is me. Pride is, let me be that big stone over here. Put me in the middle Whereas unity realizes that every, there is no joints, that they are refined and they're placed together. And now God is going to release a blessing just because it's triggered by unity. The anointing will come from the head, Jesus Christ, the head of the church. It will come down and hit your life and it will hit the beard. We've taught you beard is leadership. That's why they pulled out the beard of Jesus. They stripped him of the leadership that was underneath him. They all scattered, yea, all but him. And that oil went all the way down to the skirt and to the hem of his garments. You and I are that skirt, that cloak, that hem. And it was that anointing, as we've taught you, the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, she was healed Because she touched the hem of the garment of Jesus Christ. That Christian was anointed all the way out. And it was the bottom of the body that healed that woman. Again, I underline unity. I'm not sure if I've taught you. I don't think I have in this church in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 1 talked about this vision that Ezekiel had. And it was about this... uh, uh, like a, a, um, a, a wheel within a wheel, like a gyroscope. And it talked about uh, this movement of this wheel. And I'll just read a moment to you underlining unity, Ezekiel 1. Maybe if we have uh, time and access and the Lord leads, we'll teach on the book of Ezekiel. But again, I just underline the aspect of unity, of unity, And Ezekiel 1, it talks about this whirlwind that came out of the north, and it talked about these four living creatures. Now again, it's not actually creatures, it speaks of the the bride in four distinct dimensions. I'll have to teach that later, but again, the Bible says, watch now, unity, their, their wings were joined one to another, and they did not, watch beloved, they did not turn where they each wanted to turn where they each one wanted to turn. They each had a face, one of a man, one of a lion, (coughs) one of an ox, and one of an eagle. And their wings stretched upward. Two wings were joined one to another, and two wings covered their body. And each one went, watch now, where the Spirit was leading them to go. Okay, and they turned not wherever they went. And it goes on to say, as they went, the four sides, they did not turn where they each wanted to go. For they were uh, the living creatures, they were a wheel within a wheel, and wheresoever the Spirit went, they went. And the spirit of the living creatures was within the wheels, and they were led by the spirit. So in other words, uh, these four living creatures, without getting too much into it, really refers to his bride in four distinct dimensions, which we'll teach you on those dimensions. But the issue is that they were like a a whirlwind, a, 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 a gyroscope, and they were a wheel within a wheel, and none of them turned to their own will. They were all in unity and unified by the moving of the Spirit. So when we have a physical gathering together, that's the beauty where you see this whirlwind of fire of God's uh, living ones, and now we're all moving, and you could sense the movement of God's spirit it's like worship teams that catch the the moving of God's spirit and and now he's playing and she's singing and now songs are born of the Holy Spirit because we're not following our own individual selves pride has been decimated now the spirit of God is moving like a wheel within a wheel and that's what's going to happen and is happening 
right now. I believe during this time that God has you and I, this nation in a quarry, and I believe He is unifying His body, yea, even His bride right now in this season where you don't see it yet. It's an invisible work of the quarry, and He's using every lockdown, every heartache, every situation to bring forth an an invisible refining, preparing, cutting, and weaponry that he's going to use shortly here down the road. Oh, dry your eye, beloved saint, and lift up your head because God is doing an invisible work in your life, within your church, within the nation that you and I live in, and yea, within the nations. Oh, I'm excited. I hope you are off the couch and doing a Jericho march around the kitchen table. Someone shout unity out there. There's no individualism. Pride is decimated and humility will reign. Humility will reign. What is God doing in the quarry? Let me go back and make sure. What is God doing in your life? You should say, he is building a spiritual house. He's building me. Good, brother. That's exactly what he's doing. Well, how come, sister? She says, I don't see any work. I don't know what he's doing. I don't hear any, I don't hear God. I don't see anything. I don't know. Listen, sister, it's an invisible work. Did you know that he's doing an invisible work before it's manifest in the outward? Are you willing, spiritual person, to accept the things of the Spirit and not discard them as foolishness? The Bible says you walk by faith and not by sight. Have we, have we, have we come so carnal and solical? We need to see everything and some evidence that God's actually active and alive in my life. He's doing an invisible work. You're not going to hear the tools of working in your personal relationships. You're not going to hear the hammer of working with a spouse that's unsaved. You're not going to hear the, the iron tool of an employee that steals and, and, and seems to be getting ahead. You're not going to hear and see the work of a neighbor that won't show any respect and, and on and on and on. You're, you're not going to see that work until much later. Where is God's quarry? It's this life. There's no waste. You and I have at our disposal right now an understanding that this is life's quarry and that God will finish the project. He that began the work will do what? He'll finish it. I hate to uh, replay some of the war uh, scenes of our building during the years ago. But as I mentioned, we had uh, multiple building projects going on. I'm talking about Christ finishing the work he started. And one of the jobs of building this house, Tina will remember, it was 2232 West Wind Drive. And uh, the foreman uh, of that particular crew, as I came out to check on them, I didn't see him nor the crew. So we had it framed up. There was no windows. There was nothing. There was, there was no activity happening. And uh, so I, I made a call, and I couldn't get a hold of uh, the foreman of this particular crew for this home. I still couldn't get a hold of him. I finally got a hold of his wife, and she said, I don't know where he is. Basically, long story short, the guy went AWOL, and uh, we couldn't find him. And two and three weeks had passed. I actually had to move another crew over to finish the work because the foreman went uh, he went sideways and left the work unfinished let me tell you that Jesus Christ is the foreman that God is the master builder and Jesus isn't going to go a wall in building your life and mine your 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 the the building of your spiritual house is not so complicated for him that he says I can't finish this work I guess I made a mistake when I <laughs> when I started with Steve no he knows how to prepare to refine in love in only a way that he can do it. We're in the midst of all of the challenges, tears, and trials that we say yes, Lord, unto him. We say yes. 
just a couple of more uh, tools that God's using. He's using personal relationships. He's using ways and means to destroy pride, hidden areas of pride in my life. Why, why, why can't you be taught, sister? Why, why can't someone at least propose something to you without you having to get bristled up and be so touchy and now you won't speak to them? And there's a host of things that way that God's going to begin to uh, refine in your life and mine. Number three, tools of this life in his quarry. Watch now, this one's a little more difficult, but it's been, uh, it's been an agency at least in this season for me. It's called sorrow. It's called sorrow. Now, I'm going to cheer you up before we're done, so just hang in there, okay? I don't want you to go out and, and stand in front of a bus. And, and, uh, uh, but I'm going to say to you what your Bible declares. It's Ecclesi Ecclesiastes 7, verse 3. So I'm giving you the, the some of the tools. I got 10. I'm going to give you four. I have 10 tools in your Bible that God uses in his spiritual quarry. What's his spiritual quarry? This life, brother. This life. Personal relationships, if you let him, he'll use that tool. He'll use tools to decimate pride. Why? Pride is the essence of Satan and his minions that God will not permit. Three, it's sorrow. It's called the agency of sorrow. Ecclesiastes 7.3. Sorrow is better than giddiness. For by the sorrow of the heart, it actually will be made better. Wow. That's why you know this is a holy book, because we wouldn't say that. We'd say, oh, hey, you know what? Laughter brings joy, and, and joy is this, and strength to my bones. And yet your Bible is, if you let me say this, it is littered with the agency of sorrow. Listen to the work and the agency of sorrow in the quarry of life. In the quarry of life. Brother, now listen. In this life, it is, it is, it is filled with with, with uh, the, the sorrow on so many fronts. This quarry has sorrow in it. In heaven, listen now, there is no sorrow. The agency of sorrow will not be found. That work is only done in life's quarry here, and it's called sorrow. Sorrow came in through the fall and the disobedience of Adam and Eve, and it is port, uh, portion uh, of, of sin, and it now is part of mankind's dilemma called sorrow. It's called sorrow. It is an agency, a tool within God's quarry. Did you hear that? It's actually an agency, a tool within God's spiritual quarry uh, called life. Again, it's only here on earth, but not in heaven. In heaven, beloved, there'll be no sorrow. Oh, I need a shout. I need a, I need a, a charismatic hallelujah out there. there. There'll be no sorrow. There'll be no sickness. There'll be no tears. He'll wipe away the tears from your life and mine. Oh, I just get excited. Now watch. The Christian, you and I are going to have sorrow, and that's going to be found in the quarry of living this life in a host of places in seasons of your life. You and I need to recognize the agency of sorrow and watch and manage it according to how God's Word declares how to manage sorrow. Sorrow is like a, a, a mordant. A mordant. What's a mordant? A mordant is a, uh, I'll just, it's an oxide that is used uh, to place, uh, to be, it's an oxide to be mixed with dyes or stains so that they are permanently in a fabric. Okay, it's called a mordant. It's, a, it's an actual oxide that they would put in stains, they would put in colors, and they would be mixed. And so now it's a dye that actually goes into clothing. And so sorrow is like that. There isn't going to be much of anything in our lives that won't have at least some type of fabric where sorrow has been a part of your life and of the temple and of the, bu of the building of the temple. And as a matter of fact, the Bible declares that Jesus himself, you and I were redeemed. Please listen. You and I were redeemed by Christ in sorrow. It was in sorrow. The Bible says, I'll try to find the scripture. I wrote it down. The Bible says in Mark 14, 
uh, verse uh, 34, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane said, I am exceedingly sorrowful even unto death that you and I were redeemed by sorrow. He, he poured out sweat like an unto uh, blood and he's declared that I am exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Now watch this. Here's the difference between your sorrow, Christian, and someone who has sorrow in the world that isn't a Christian, that isn't saved, that doesn't have the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The difference, according to your Bible, is that you and I, according to your Bible, we have a hope in the midst of sorrow. Paul said in 1 Corinthians uh, I believe it's, uh, I'll find the scripture for you. I don't want to get uh, sloppy with his word. But he said here in uh, First uh, Thessalonians 4.13, he said, We are not like those that have no hope, but we are Christians that have sorrow with hope. So godly sorrow, this agency within life, you and I still have a residing hope, and it's the hope of God, it's the Lord Jesus Christ himself, that no matter what the situation is, I'm talking to someone out in the hospital right now, and it looks hopeless for you, and you are filled with sorrow, I want to declare to you that you'll live and not die, that the hope of Christ is within you, and he will raise you up now in the name of Jesus Christ. Those in the world that have no hope, listen, it's called despair. Those that are unsaved and those that will find themselves unfortunately in hell itself, that is where sorrow without hope goes to die and it becomes despair. Men and women that carry despair, they have no hope. You and I will have the mordant of sorrow and it will touch fabric of life, your life and mine, but there is a hope within the tear that we know your Bible declares with every tear, sheaves of joy and harvest are coming right around the corner. Oh, I need a shout out there in the name of Jesus Christ. It is a tool within God's quarry to refine, to prepare, to, to, to uh, weaponize, and to bring forth a glory that He has in the building of your life and mine. Again, you are a Christian that will have sorrow in your life. It will have sorrow, but you have hope. Sorrow without hope is despair. And despair is found in the unredeemed and it is found its home in hell itself. That's where despair will be found. Now, what kind of works can the chisel of sorrow, the tool of sorrow, can it accomplish again you and I uh, we're actually redeemed in sorrow. Again, Christ said, I am exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Watch, what can, what can the agency of sorrow do? If Solomon said that it's better than giddiness, it's better than frivolity, you know. Oh, that was funny. Oh, blah, 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 blah. He said, look, just, um, he's breaking it down. He said, now sorrow actually has a bigger work it can do in your heart than actually giddiness and frivolity can do okay what's it gonna do one it brings forth repentance of 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 my true repentance watch now can come from from sorrow in a life boy nothing like uh, deep sorrow to bring the wayward soul back to the lord jesus christ how many of you out there have have can testify of the tears of sorrow through whatever uh, agency uh, it, and how it came to you and I that actually brought you back or to the Lord Jesus himself. It was through sorrow, my big NFL brother, through the agency of sorrow in the quarry of life, salvation came to him. It didn't come because he was uh, drafted and because of all of the highlights. 
salvation and true repentance came to him and millions of other people through the agency of the quarry of life of called sorrow that brought forth true repentance. Began to straighten the wayward reed, began to bring the addict back to the Lord Jesus Christ, began to bring that Christian Back to a straight and narrow path. What, 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 what is sorrow going to do? It's going to cause fervent intercession that frivolity and giddiness can't do. You see, beloved, when Stephen was stoned to death, the church began to pray fervently. When, when the apostle James was beheaded, the Bible says that when the church got together prayers began to shake the very house itself, and, and sorrow will bring fervent intercession. It'll bring a fire and a heat that giddiness and frivolity of, of, of shallow saints will never do. It is the agency in the quarry of life of wherever sorrow comes from that can develop within your life and mine. Watch, deep men and women of prayer. You should see sorrow as an agency that beckons you and woos you to your knees to become a man and a woman of deep, ardent prayer. Nothing like sorrow that will call you away from the TV, call you away from the video games, call you away from the chatter and the clamor of this and that. It is the agency of sorrow that will beckon the man and woman of God and bring tears from you and develop the deeper life in you. It is the fervent intercession that is happening in the quarry, in the agency of sorrow. When some of you were sick, I tell you what, it was, it was on the knees and tears and praying and, and commanding and declaring. And each time I get a text and a phone call uh, that you've been released from the hospital, I'm like, oh, Jesus, you know, let's, let's, let's get this one out now. Sorrow is a universal language uh, in God's quarry upon the earth regardless of age. Regardless of skin color, pedigree, monetary strength or weakness, doesn't matter where I go, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Moscow, uh, Central America, sorrow is a mordant. It is a, an oxide that has uh, a place to stain and a dye within the fabric of humanity. Why? Because it's in his quarry. He's using it. He's using it. What else? Almost done here. Sorrow breaks down hard, resistant, old Adamic natures. Are you listening to me out there? Or am I putting you to sleep already? Okay. So, so now watch this. So you have, we get born again, and some of us, we still remain, even though the Bible declares we've been given a new nature, the process can be very slow. And so the old Adamic nature, which is filled with stubbornness and stiff-neckedness, uh, sorrow has a way of taking that Christian mule and beginning to break it down and to uh, subdue it where we become gentle little children. We become pliable, we become sensitive, uh, we are filled. Sorrow has a way to now, watch this, bring forth a deepening of empathy and compassion for a brother, a sister, someone else within my life, whereas before sorrow, I didn't really care so much about him, her, this or that, but the agency of sorrow will begin to break down a, a stubborn old nature that's in, in, a, in its death rattle and bring forth the gentleness, the kindness, the, the, um, the uh, suppleness of what Christ is wanting to build in your temple and within mine. Sorrow is the, the Mary of the alabaster jar. That when you and I truly are broken, a fragrance, a perfume will come up within that life and it will actually fill that business, fill that home, fill that marriage, fill every area that God takes you to. Sorrow is the Mary of the alabaster jar that causes it to be broken and that perfume can come out unashamed. Sorrow 
will bring forth a harvest of fruitfulness. Did you hear me, beloved? It's not all bad news. <laughs> Sorrow is a tool within the quarry of life that God uses. Now, don't look at it because you are sick and go, how can God allow me to be sick? Okay, brother, you could flip that around and say, now, you are sick. You do have a cold. This has happened to you. But he is a healer. Why else would he call himself Yahweh Rapha, God who heals, if there wasn't a need to bring healing? Almost everyone within your Bible went through some type of calamity, sickness, and disease, and there was the healing capacities that God provides for you and I. So now you and I could look at the situation and realize that in the midst of sorrow, watch, God can bring forth a harvest. One of the most sorrowful men in your Bible was Joseph. I won't take time to go through his life with you, if you've been with us for any length of time, you have some idea that that young man who started out with great vision and dreams, shared them with his mother and father and his brothers, had a life, the Bible declares, of such sorrow. His life was filled with sorrow. We just turn the pages and there's the brothers 13 years in prison and, and here he is in the pit. And, and, and family, you talk about family issues and family problems. You have good company here. Good company here. And yet at the end of his life, towards the end, he became the prime minister of the most powerful nation on earth, Egypt. And this is what the Bible declares about his fruitfulness. The Bible says here in uh, um, Genesis 43, it says that his, his, his fruitfulness, actually uh, the bows of Joseph and his fruitfulness went over the walls of the actual Jewish uh, separations and actually brought fruitfulness to the Gentiles. Did you hear that? That, that, that there was such fruitfulness, the Bible called Joseph, a, 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 he was, he was a, 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 a vine that went over the wall of separation of Judaism and actually his life brought forth fruitfulness to the Gentiles. He actually fed them and said, look, you need to uh, prepare for this is what's coming. Seven years of famine and seven years of prosperity. And now take this and put. And he shared that with even the Egyptians that did not even know Yahweh. That they did not even know God. Listen, all of the sorrow he went through. The Bible says that when you sow tears in sorrow, there are sheaves of fruitfulness and harvest coming for you. Don't just look at your sorrow and tears and say, God, how come? realize spiritual man he's doing a deep invisible work in your life and he's using sorrow to accomplish all of these things fruitfulness will come from your life fruitfulness will come over the bows of separation and bring forth fruitfulness to those in your life what else is sorrow doing am I dragging this on what time is it I didn't even set the second alarm <laughs> Are you done with me out there? See, I got some family here and they dare not say yes. Watch. Uh, sorrow, almost finished with sorrow. It will bring quietness to the restless soul. Nothing like sorrow to begin to bring the restless soul to a place where now peace can be found. It'll bring, it'll stop all of the movement and bring forth a, a quietness. And lastly, there's a, a bunch of things, the agency of sorrow. It will cause a willingness in that soul to surrender totally to God. Nothing like sorrow to, uh, to begin to bring forth a willingness to surrender all to God. Now let me just quickly, I, I promise I'll go quickly. I don't want to, but I'm going to go quickly. Let me give you the fourth, one of the fourth, the fourth tool uh, within God's spiritual quarry. One, personal relationships we mentioned, okay. So now I'm going to look at them differently. Two, he's going to decimate pride. I don't even see it sometimes here and there and this and that. He knows how to work that out of your life and mine. 
Three, he's going to use the agency of sorrow. The agency of sorrow. And fourth, lastly, he's going to use tribulations. He's going to use tribulations. Now watch this. I wrote this down. I didn't read it anywhere. Nothing wrong with reading it. You can snatch. Uh, you can uh, uh, scratch. And you can hatch. Okay? And it's full game on my end. Any minister, I get uh, stuff from the ministers like, okay, you want to you pickpocket that for me? You could have it. It's public domain. And if you got something good, I'm going to steal it from you because it's, it's for God's people, okay? But this, uh, not that this is all that in a bag of chips, but uh, I wrote now, tribulations, the last tool of, of ten I'm going to give you. <coughs> uh, the fourth one is, it's called tribulations, Romans 5, 1 through 5. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I'm going to read a portion of it to you. We've already... Uh, read it, but uh, watch what Paul says now. Now think about your life. Now think about your life. God, what's he doing? He's building you. He's building a spiritual temple. He's building your life, brother. Okay, that's what he's doing. Okay. Two, you may not be able to see it or hear it. Why? Because it's an invisible work. That's why. Three, how's he doing it? He's got these tools here. You may not hear it. I they couldn't hear the iron tools, the chisels, the hammer, the axes. And yet, that temple was the most glorious temple on the face of the earth. And so are you. And so are you. He's going to use tribulations. Okay? Tribulations. Now, Paul said, now watch this. Think about your life. I'll tell you what tribulations are. Here's the actual Greek word. It's thalipsis. Watch this. What's tribulations? Well, that's the English word. The actual Greek word of the New Testament, it means this. <clears throat> Afflictions, troubles, um, anguish, persecution, heavy laden, burdened, affliction, to be pressed down and pressed together, oppression, distress, um, persecution, Trouble, did I say that? I'll double I'll say it. Double trouble. Double trouble. Now, knowing that, okay, knowing that, Christian, you're spiritual. Look what Paul says. He said, I glory, we glory in our tribulations. We glory in Philippus. Hold it. What do you mean you're glory in that? You're glorying in your trouble? A glory, it, lit it literally means that he's, he's rejoicing, he's reveling, watch, in the agency of tribulation. Think about what you're going through right now. Think about the nation. How are we responding to the thalipsis, th the tribulations, the troubles, the pressure, the burdens, the afflictions? Do you just look at them from a carnal end and say, God, how come and why? Look what Paul, he's the apostolic father. He says, I glory, I revel, I champion, I cheer in my tribulations. What is it that he saw that he knew by the Spirit and he was able to champion, to shout, to declare, and to be filled with joy in his tribulations? Left for dead, beaten, stoned. Five times, you know, uh, the, the list goes on in that brother's life, and yet he stands up here. We bring him to the actual uh, witness stand, and he says, I glory in my thalipsis. I glory in my tribulations and all of my trouble, my persecutions, my heartache, my sorrow, my tears. I glory it. There's something in these tribulations that Paul, by the Spirit, he was a spiritual man, he was able to see beyond what was happening in his life. And I pray that for me and for you, that we'll look at sorrow differently and we'll look at all of the tribulations differently from this moment on. I glory in my tribulations. And then look what he says. He tells us part of the reason why. He says, because tribulations worketh, what does your Bible say? Worketh what? Patience. The actual Greek word in there, worketh, watch now, it means to need. To need. <coughs> Tina made a... Uh, Thanksgiving little meal here, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, I call them Mormon rolls, and they're not really Mormon rolls, <coughs> they're just rolls that are, you know, yeast, and they come up, they're, they're delicious, and I'm wearing them right here today, and you can't see them, okay, <laughs> so here is the outworking, Paul says, tribulations, watch, worketh patience, it needs, it's needing patience, 
Here's what I was going to tell you. I didn't get to tell you this was the whole. See, the heart is cleansed. Watch. The heart is cleansed by the blood of Jesus. That's what your Bible says. That the human heart is cleansed by the blood of Jesus. That's good. Okay. Well, the head, according to your Bible, is cleansed by this word, by the washing of the water of the word. Your, your minds, mind are being renewed by the washing of the water of the word. But your feet, your feet are washed and cleansed through tribulations. Did you hear that? So your heart is washed by the blood of Jesus. Praise God. Yay. Okay, and my thoughts are being renewed and washed by the word of God. Yay. Well, guess what? Your feet, your feet are washed and cleansed. How? By the agency of tribulations, trouble, heartache. Trials, tribulations, pressures, on and on and on. And Paul says, I glory in these tribulations. Why? Because they are needing, they are working, watch, within my life, patience. You see, you see. look, the blood doesn't give you patience. The word doesn't give you patience. But tribulations, the ellipsis, that will need within you, work within you, patience. The actual Greek word is hupomone. It will keep me under the word of God. It will keep me low. It will keep me on my knees. Give me this day my daily bread. Oh, I am excited about tribulations. Now ask me tomorrow in the midst of my sorrow filled with hope. But right now, <laughs> I'm excited about the ellipsis. So he saw something. He lived in a realm where he looked beyond the natural uh, agency of tribulation and saw something spiritual. And he declares to you and I, and we should receive this. The natural man won't receive the things of the Spirit, but the spiritual man receives them and accepts them. He says, Tribulations, everything that you and I just read, will worketh patience, hupomone. It will bring forth the capacity. Oh, Hupomone to stay under. When you're feeling impatient with a mate, with a child, with a situation that is repetitive over and over and over, the blood of Jesus cleanses your heart. The Word of God washes your mind, but tribulation will perfect your feet. It's tribulations that will worketh patience. Watch now. And patience gives birth to... The Bible says in King James, experience. Experience. What does that mean? I'm going to tell you what it means. Are you done with me out there? I think I'll stop because that part's too good. God bless you. Experience is dokami. Dokami. It, it actually means to, to be proven, to be stamped 100%. Experience means that character has been authenticated. It means, watch, he says, I glory in the ellipsis. Wow. Brother, you were beaten, stoned, left for dead, shipwrecked. You were, you were, you were uh, 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 ostracized by your, by your uh, Jewish brothers. And the list goes on and on and on. You were in Arabia for 14 years without friends. Without friends. And the host goes on in terms of what he went through. And he says, I glory, I revel in them. Why? Because they're working patience in me. Because the blood can't do that. And the word won't do that. It'll tell me what's happening. But it's, it's tribulations that will work at the experience, which means the character must be proven. It means there is an authenticity, a stamp, that now your character has been born and proven. What an hour you and I live in to have the character necessary to carry. Politicians, government officials, wherever God has you, beloved, listen to me, be a man and a woman of godly character. Another minister in New York, big church in New York. Well, you know what happened, okay? 
fell into adultery, on and on and on and again. They actually had to, they, they fired him. They fired him, which evidently was needed. And now he's going through sorrow, but he declared, I now have a hope in my sorrow. And God is rebuilding him, and we pray for him and his family and marriage. The point is that there needs to be, by God's deep work of tribulations, to prove you and I and prepare you and I in terms of character. He says, now, tribulations gives birth. And worketh patience, patience, experience. Watch this now. This was good. The actual Latin word of experience, ex. Experience, ex means out from. Per, ex, experience. Per means out from yourself, out from your inner person. And then the last part, uh, I-N-C, it's literally science. It's ex per science, experience. It means out from your inner person, your inner self, science, a knowledge about who you really are from within. So when he declares that tribulations give birth to patience, it worketh patience, Patience worketh uh, experience. It literally means it's an coming out of your person, out of now with the knowledge of who you really are. Peter said, I'll never leave you. I'll never deny you. Uh, guess what's coming, Peter? You have some experience that's coming to you because it was when the little rooster crowed, that you found out that X, it came X out of you. Your true person, what was already inside of you. Paul says tribulations are going to bring forth character. And you're going to see and others see who you really and truly are. And lastly, experience brings forth hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Uh, for uh, God has been born in our, in our own hearts. So again, Paul says in Romans 5, 1 through 8, he says, I rejoice in my tribulations. How can you do that? Because he was a spiritual man. He knew life's quarry, that tribulations were bringing forth a beauty within that living stone. He says, I rejoice in my tribulations. It's going to work out patience. Patience will give birth to what? Remember what your Bible says? Patience will give birth to experience. Experience will give birth to hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured forth his spirit into our own hearts. Okay, so we're going to pray now. I hope I didn't drag you through this too much. God's spiritual quarry. If you're able to stand, uh, we'll pray together today. God's spiritual quarry. I hope uh, God has answered those questions that maybe silently you've asked. God, what are you doing in my life right now? He's building you. He's building a spiritual house. I don't see any work. You may not see any work. Why? Just like the temple of old, he is bringing forth living stones. He is using the iron tools, the chisels, the axe. He is using whatever necessarily agency he needs to bring it about. He's building you. Nothing is wasted, and this time should not be wasted either. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for uh, the Holy Word of God. And I would pray in the name of Jesus Christ that no longer would we be wondering what you are doing, that now we can declare by faith and not by sight that you again are building a spiritual house, that you are doing a deep work within each and every single life, listening and watching to me, and you are doing a deep work in this nation and the nations. For even though we are going through sorrow, yea, we have hope. And hope does not disappoint because we serve the God of hope. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that as we begin to see the personal relationships round about us, we would see them differently now through a spiritual lens and not a natural lens. I pray over the very power of pride and we declare broken and wither up and die in Jesus' name. I pray where everyone is suffering with sorrow that let Joseph be a reminder that in the midst of tears, in the midst of sorrow, God is going to bring 
fruitfulness that will extend over the walls and boundaries and bring fruitfulness to others beyond your realm. And I declare through every thalipsis and tribulation, whatever it might look like and however it has been packaged, that now we too would glory and revel in it. Why? Because it is going to produce patience. It's going to work through experience and character. It's going to bring forth hope. And hope won't disappoint. We thank you even now in the name of Jesus Christ. Someone who loves him, shout amen.